Thank you for joining us for the U.S. Astronaut Hall of Fame induction ceremony honoring our nation's space heroes. Please rise for the presentation of colors by Boy Scout Troop 369 from Merritt Island, Florida, followed by our national anthem performed by Jennifer Drake. What so proudly we hailed at the twilight's last gleaming, whose broad stripes and bright stars through the perilous fight. O'er the ramparts we watched were so gallantly streaming. And the rocket's red glare, the bombs bursting in air, gave proof through the night that our flag was still there. Oh, say does that star-spangled banner yet wave. Or the land of the free and the home of the brave. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the Chief Operating Officer of Kennedy Space Center Visitor Complex, Mr. William Moore. Please take your seat, thank you. Welcome today. Uh, thank you, Jennifer, for an absolutely wonderful rendition of our national anthem. On behalf of uh, all of our Delaware North Company employees around the world, but especially those crew members here at the Kennedy Space Center Visitor Complex, I would like to welcome you to today's induction ceremony celebrating the ninth class of space shuttle astronauts into the U.S. Astronaut Hall of Fame. Thank you all for joining us on this wonderful afternoon. It is a privilege for us to host this induction ceremony and to be part of this momentous occasion that honors leaders in the spaceflight community who are both deserving of our recognition and our respect. There is no better place on Earth to host this celebration than right here at the Kennedy Space Center, the epic center of spaceflight. A truly special place where you can witness history being made. Three weeks ago, Space Shuttle Atlantis lifted off pad 39A on her last scheduled flight to the International Space Station and returned last week after a successful 12-day mission. From launch pads a few miles away, men were launched to the moon. Robot explorers were spent to deep space missions to explore the planets of our solar system, where each one of the legends who will stand on the stage today, representing American manned spaceflight program from Mercury, Gemini, Apollo, to today's space shuttle, began their legendary journeys. I'd like to take just a moment to acknowledge a few people with us today, NASA Administrator Charles Bolden, and Kennedy Space Center Director Robert Cabana, who will be joining us shortly for the Hall of Fame astronauts, as well as my own fellow colleague from Delaware North, 
Vice President of Planning and Education, Astronaut John McBride. Thank you for being with us today. I would also like to take a moment to recognize the significant contributions to today's ceremony by the Astronaut Scholarship Foundation. Their board of directors, led by Hall of Fame astronaut Al Warden, and Executive Director Lynn LeBlanc. Thank you both. And now I'd like to welcome to the stage today's Master of Ceremonies. Throughout his career, he has turned in outstanding eclectic performances in film, television, and stage. He initially gained attention in 1984 on the big screen opposite Demi Moore in No Small Affair, followed by his iconic performance in an endearing misfit in John Hughes' popular 86 film, Pretty in Pink. On stage, he has starred in various productions, including Broadway, Neil Simon's Brighton Beach Memoirs, but his talent is not limited to just acting. He's also a gifted filmmaker as well. He co-wrote, produced, starred in two well-known independent films with director Richard Shankman, who is also here in the audience today. He recently won an Emmy Award for his work with Alan Harper in the CBS number one comedy, Two and a Half Men. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcome to the stage, Mr. John Cryer. Thank you, Mr. Moore. Thank you. Wow, that is uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. That, uh, that will probably be the first uh, and last time that I am ever introduced to the theme of the right stuff. Um, it's, it's exciting when it happens. Uh, I am thrilled to be here today. It is, uh, it is truly an honor to be surrounded by, uh, by so many important people, uh, uh, you know, and titans of industry and powerful politicians and genuine heroes of, uh, of space exploration uh, and, and me, <laughs> a, a guy on a TV show. Uh, like many people, you're probably wondering uh, what I'm doing here. Uh, I, I'm, I'm hosting this event. Uh, I am an actor, yes, but, uh, but unlike legendary performers such as uh, Leonard Nimoy or Will Wheaton, I've never been on Star Trek. Uh, I haven't even been on Battlestar Galactica. Uh, so why is, uh, is TV, TV's John Cryer here? Uh, perhaps because of, of the fine work uh, that uh, so many people think I did on, uh, on War Games or uh, in Ferris Bueller's Day Off. Um, I, I wasn't actually in either of those. Uh, no, I am actually here um, because I am a space geek. Um, and I think I represent space geeks everywhere. I, 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 uh, I, I have been one all my life, uh, and to be standing here at the Kennedy Space Center is just a fanboy dream come true. Uh, you know, Gemini, or, or as all the cool people call it, Gemini. <laughs> um, uh, Apollo was here, uh, uh, the, the mighty Saturn V, you know, it, it all happened right here. Um, and from the moment I arrived at the Cape, it, it has been all that I can do to keep from saying, so Buzz, when you were like on the moon and stuff, <laughs> was it awesome? <laughs> um, so, see, I mean, even from the time I was a little boy, I mean, even younger than, than my own son is now, you know, I, I've watched in awe as, as NASA progressed from you know, one miracle to another. I mean, I, I, I thrilled as the, the mighty birds lifted off the pad and, and gazed at the poetic slow motion beauty of, of a spacewalk and marveled at, at the sight of human beings jumping and, and driving and playing golf on the surface of the moon. I, I, I mean, I, I held my breath during splashdowns and, and later during the majestic, graceful descent of the shuttle. I, I spent countless hours building scale models of, uh, of our spacecraft, making sure the decals were on just right, you know. And I have a shelf lined with space books. Um, I even have uh, the, the original G.I. Joe, not the little piddly one, but the 12 the, the incher uh, in his original Mercury 7 spacesuit in the Mercury, Mercury 7 craft in the box. people. Okay, maybe other guys were hanging out with girls. I had NASA. So 
Uh, it, it thrills me to no end to be making my first visit to the Kennedy Space Center. Um, I have had the opportunity to meet uh, some of the astronauts uh, whom I have looked up to since I was a boy. And, uh, and though astronauts are often referred to as you know, legends and heroes and, and paragons of skill and fortitude and ambition, um, they themselves will be the first to tell you of, of their fears, uh, flaws, and, and foibles. Uh, well, no, scratch that. Uh, the first people to tell you would be their spouses um, uh, at, at length, um, uh, until it gets, frankly, a little awkward. Um, but, uh, but I think that we must always remember uh, that it is perhaps because they are not perfect, you know, because of, of their essential humanity, that what they achieve is so important. Uh, they are the embodiment of human possibility. And what they do on a daily basis is, is to remind us that we, as a, as a species, with all our imperfections, can achieve wonders. So I am honored to be here today celebrating the men and women uh, who have inspired generations to reach higher and travel further, uh, to wonder and explore and create our future. So now it is my privilege to introduce to you the attending members of the U.S. Astronaut Hall of Fame joining us today. Okay, today, a founder of the Astronaut Scholarship Foundation. He is one of, the, of America's original seven astronauts. He has the distinction of being the first human to conduct missions in both outer and inner space. He flew the second American orbital flight, piloting his spacecraft through three revolutions of the Earth. And later, he participated in the Navy's Man in the Sea project as an aquanaut in Sea Lab 2 program, Scott Carpenter. On July 20, 1969, he and Neil Armstrong landed at the Sea of Tranquility, becoming the first men to walk on the moon. His first space flight was aboard Gemini 12, during which he spent more than five hours outside the vehicle spacewalking. Today, he is a member of the Share Space Foundation, Buzz Aldrin. He served as the Lunar Module Pilot aboard the first manned mission of the Apollo program, Apollo 7. He later served as Chief of the Skylab Branch of the Flight Crew Directorate, overseeing components of the United States' first space station. Today, he shares his thoughts on space flight through periodic columns, lectures, and his book, The All-American Boys, Walt Cunningham. He was a member of the Apollo 13 crew that struggled to return to Earth after an oxygen tank explosion aborted the mission as it approached the moon in 1970. Selected by NASA for its fifth class of astronauts in April 1966, he later was commander of the Space Shuttle Enterprise approach and landing test flights, Fred Hayes. He served as command module pilot on the 1971 Apollo 15 moon mission, during which he orbited the moon while his crewmates explored the surface. On the homeward journey, he took the farthest out spacewalk 200,000 miles from the Earth, moving along handrails on the outside of Endeavor to retrieve, to retrieve film cassettes from two moon ramping cameras. Al Warden. <laughs> He became the 10th person to walk on the moon aboard Apollo 16 in 1972. During three outside excursions over three days, he and fellow astronaut John Young drove a lunar rover 16 miles and collected 213 pounds of lunar rock and soil. Today, he is president of the Charlie Duke Enterprises and is an active speaker. Charlie Duke. He worked for 59 days in orbit as a member of the second Skylab space station crew in 1973. In 1982, he commanded the third orbital test flight of Space Shuttle Columbia, the only mission to land at White Sands, New Mexico. He is a retired colonel from the U.S. Marine Corps, Jack Luzma.
He lived in space for 59 days aboard the Skylab space station in 1973, during which he conducted three spacewalks to exchange film and erect a sun shield to cool the orbiting laboratory. Ten years later, he returned to space aboard Columbia on the first flight of the Space Lab Laboratory. Currently, he is an adjunct professor at the University of Alabama in Huntsville. Owen Garriott. He piloted the fourth and final test flight of the Space Shuttle Columbia before commanding Discovery on its maiden voyage in 1984. His last assignment was the first planned and controlled mission by a foreign customer and the first to fly eight crew members. Later, he served as Vice President of Raytheon Aerospace Engineering, Hank Hartsfield. A three-flight veteran, he and fellow crew member Bob Crippen were the first to fly an orbiter in close proximity to a free-flying satellite on STS-7. He went on to command the return to flight mission after Challenger was lost. He left NASA in 1989 and, beca and later became president and CEO of Axis Space in Maryland. Rick Houck. He has flown four shuttle missions, piloting the first night launch and commanding the others, including the maiden flight of Endeavour. He also served as chief of NASA astro uh, the NASA astronaut office for five years and is currently executive vice president and chief operating officer of United Space Alliance, Dan Brandenstein. <laughs> He commanded four of his five space shuttle missions, including the first docking of a shuttle with the Russian space station Mir. He served as chief of the astronaut office until September 1994 and retired from NASA soon thereafter. He currently spends his time giving motivational speeches and setting world aviation records in his spare time. Uh, Hoot Gibson. He will be forever remembered by an iconic photo taken of him flying freely without a tether over the Earth on mission STS-41B. During the flight, he tested the manned maneuvering unit, a jet-powered backpack that allowed him to float away from the shuttle. Six years later, he returned to space aboard Discovery to deploy the Hubble Space Telescope. He currently works for Lockheed Martin Space Systems Company in Denver. Bruce McCandless. He flew three shuttle missions and was a member of the first spacewalking team to repair a satellite in orbit. He launched twice more on the missions immediately before and after the loss of Challenger. He retains the distinction of being the only American to test fly the Russian manned maneuvering unit. Currently, he serves as Director of Science, Mathematics, and Technology Education at Western, Western Washington University. Pinky Nelson. He commanded two space flights and piloted another, logging 463 hours in space. His first flight was the maiden voyage of the space shuttle Discovery and the first shuttle pad abort. He went on to command the third shuttle mission after the Challenger tra tragedy. He is currently director of NASA's Johnson Space Center in Houston, Texas. Michael Coates. He has flown three shuttle missions, commanding STS-31 to successfully deploy the Hubble Space Telescope. He went on to command STS-46, deploying the European retrievable carrier, Eureka, and the Italian tethered satellite. From 1997 to 2000, he held the position of Deputy Director of NASA's Kennedy Space Center. Currently, he serves as Vice President of Engineering and Integration and Chief Technology Officer at United Space Alliance, Lauren Shriver. He is a veteran of five shuttle missions and the first astro astronaut to log 1,000 hours on the shuttle. He made NASA's first unplanned spacewalk and performed three spacewalks during the first Hubble Space Telescope repair mission. He is currently a professor at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, Jeff Hoffman. A four-time space shuttle veteran, he distinguished himself as both commander of the first Hubble Space Telescope repair mission and as pilot of discovery for the shuttle program's return to flight mission following the 1986 Challenger disaster. 
He has recently retired as the President and Chief Executive Officer for United Space Alliance, Dick Covey. His first mission aboard Space Shuttle Columbia was the last to fly before the Challenger accident in 1986. He also piloted Space Shuttle Discovery on the five-day STS-31 mission to deploy the Hubble Space Telescope. He flew twice more, logging more than 680 hours in orbit. Today he serves as the NASA Administrator, Charles Bolden. A four-time shuttle astronaut, he commanded the first mission to the International Space Station. He served as mission specialist for STS-27, a Department of Defense mission, launched the Ulysses probe on STS-41, and operated the U.S. microgravity payload on STS-52. He went on to become a civilian engineer assigned to the staff of the Commander, Naval Special Warfare Command, Bill Shepard. He flew five space shuttle missions and one long-duration Mir space station flight. He piloted two flights, including the third flight following the Challenger tragedy. He went on to command two missions before becoming the third American to live aboard the Russian Mir space station and set an American record of 128 days in orbit. John Blaha. He is a four-flight veteran piloting his first two space shuttle missions. Later, he commanded STS-65, during which he and his crew set a record for the longest shuttle mission at that time, and STS-88, the first space station assembly mission. He is currently the center director right here at NASA's Kennedy Space Center, Robert Cabana. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, our Hall of Fame astronauts. And now, uh, I would like to welcome to the podium a uh, Hall of Fame astronaut and Kennedy Space Center director, Mr. Robert Cabana. Well, good afternoon and welcome to the Kennedy Space Center for uh, today's Hall of Fame induction ceremony. It's a real privilege for me to be here and see four of America's finest honored in this way. My uh, crewmate on STS-53, Guy Bluford, the first African-American in space. Uh, Ken Bowersox, my running buddy in conscience. Uh, Frank Culbertson, my classmate from the Naval Academy. And uh, Kathy Thornton. Uh, Kathy always had a, a ready smile for me when times were tough. Together, they span the full 30 years of the space shuttle's amazing contributions to America's space program. And because of their accomplishments, uh, they're well deserving of this honor being bestowed on them today. There are many changes coming to the Kennedy Space Center in the days ahead as we fly out the remaining shuttle missions, transition to commercial operations in low Earth orbit, supporting research and astronauts aboard the International Space Station, and as we develop the infrastructure and technologies that once again take NASA exploring beyond our home planet. The astronauts being inducted today embody the characteristics that have made the human space program the success that it is. And they leave a legacy that will inspire generations of explorers that follow, paving the way for our future. Change is never easy, and the future sometimes seems uncertain. But the one thing I can assure you is that the KSC team is up to any challenge that the future may bring. We will continue to be a world leader in space. We will explore beyond our boundaries, and we will continue to make a difference. Why? because of this amazingly talented and dedicated team that those of us uh, on this stage have been privileged to be a very small part of. I want to thank you again uh, for coming today and welcome you. And once again, my sincere congratulations to our inductees today. Thank you. And now, ladies and gentlemen, a Hall of Fame astronaut and chairman of the Astronaut Scholarship Foundation, Colonel Al Warden.
Thank you, John. You didn't even need a script. He can't read a script anyway. <laughs> Thanks, John. The Astronaut Scholarship Foundation has been running really strong for the past 25 years. It was founded by the Mercury 7 astronauts in 1984, and its goal is to help the United States retain its world leadership in science and technology by providing scholarships to the top college students pursuing degrees in these fields. In the beginning, they awarded just $1,000 for each scholarship, and they gave out seven in the first year. Today, over 80 astronauts from every U.S. space program have joined in the effort. The foundation now disperses this year 19 $10,000 scholarships and has awarded nearly $3 million since its inception. I've got to tell you that just yesterday, the board approved six more schools, so we will be giving out $10,000 scholarships to 25 schools next year, and that's a real big jump for us. I have to tell you that we kind of pride ourselves on the fact that this is the largest monetary award given in the United States to science and engineering students at the undergraduate level based solely on merit, and this is something we're really proud of. Not only does the foundation provide scholarships, but we also promote, promote the importance of science, technology, and space exploration. One way we do this is by serving as consultant to NASA and Kennedy Space Center Visitor Complex for the U.S. Astronaut Hall of Fame where we supervise the selection process of the new astronauts that are inducted into the Hall of Fame. To do so, we put together an outside committee of outstanding people, uh, astronauts, aerospace journalists, authors, retired NASA and industry officials. Many of them are here today. The chairman is Bob Seek. Bob, where are you? Bob Seek is the chairman of the selection committee. And I'd like all of the committee that's here to stand up and take a bow, please. Thank you, Bob. To do so, we put together, oh, let's see. Uh, I can't read a script, John. I got ahead of myself. Oh, well. Good thing this wasn't last night. <clears throat> now, as most of you know, last night we held a wonderful gala to celebrate the new inductees, and what a night it was. But the evening wouldn't have been possible if it weren't for the support, and really good support, of our sponsors. That being said, I'd like to take a moment to thank our friends at NASA, Charlie Bolden, Bob Cabana and Mike Coates, two directors and the administrator of NASA, and that's a pretty big deal getting them all here at one time. Um, I'd like to also thank Bill Moore from Delaware North Park Service, who heads up the Kennedy Center uh, Visitor Complex. We appreciate your invaluable partnership with the foundation. I also want to top, thank our top induction sponsors. That's Boeing Company, James Long, Lockheed Martin, United Space Alliance and Science Applications International Corporation, and to all the others who helped support this event. Okay, let me turn it back over to John to induct this year's class. Thank you very much. Thanks, Al. Uh, and now the time has arrived. Uh, the induction of the ninth class of space shuttle astronauts into the U.S. Astronaut Hall of Fame. They will be introduced in the order in which they flew into space. Our first inductee is Guy Bluford, Jr. Bluford flew four shuttle missions during the 15 years he was in the astronaut corps. As a mission specialist and a flight engineer aboard the first night launch and landing of the space shuttle, he assisted in developing techniques for nighttime operations. On his second flight, he led the international on-orbit payload team in the training and on-orbit operations of 76 experiments in the German D-1 space lab. He launched twice more, managing the operations of several experiments in the support of the DOD Strategic Defense Initiative Office on the STS-39, followed by classified space shuttle flight STS-53. Bluford retains the distinction of becoming the first African American to fly in space. He currently is the president of, uh, of Aerospace Technology Group in Cleveland, Ohio. Let's take a look at a few video highlights from his career.
Ladies and gentlemen, astronaut Guy Bluford, Jr. To present Guy Bluford, Jr. for induction in the U.S. Astronaut Hall of Fame, please welcome Hall of Fame astronaut and Johnson Space Center director, Michael Coates. Thanks, John. It's a real privilege to be able to introduce my fellow crewman and my good friend Guy Bluford into the Astronaut Hall of Fame and it's wonderful to see Guy and Linda here this weekend. As you know, Guy is famous for being the first Afri African American astronaut to fly into space, which is an achievement of which we can all be proud. Notice that correct grammar there? <laughs> Charlie Bolden told me that's correct grammar. And he's a Marine, so we know it's true. In fact, he's my boss, so I'm sure it's true. But in fact, Guy's career is a history of remarkable achievements. An Air Force F-4 fighter pilot with 144 combat missions in Southeast Asia, a master's degree, an MBA degree, and a PhD, a veteran of four space shuttle missions, and an aerospace industry executive until his retirement as a vice president at Northrop Grumman. And of course, Guy was a member of the finest astronaut class ever selected. <laughs> Just stating the facts here, guys. If we took a vote, we'd win, right? So, okay. Guy has some other interesting first as a shuttle astronaut, including, as you saw, being a crewman on the first night launch and night landing of the shuttle, and perhaps being on the most crowded shuttle missions ever flown. His 61A mission was the only shuttle mission to launch with eight crewmen, which is a crowd even for the relatively spacious space shuttle. And our STS-39 crew of seven was, and it still is, the tallest crew ever to launch, averaging more than six feet in height, with the equivalent of seven six-footers working up in the flight deck at the same time during the rendezvous, it was crowded even in zero gravity. So better than most shuttle astronauts, Guy can probably relate to the crowded confines of the Apollo and Soyuz capsules that a lot of the folks here have flown in. It was our STS-39 mission that most impressed me with Guy's abilities. Guy and I were the only two veterans on the seven-person crew on a busy and round-the-clock mission with complicated and still unique in-space maneuvers and multiple crew intensive payloads. Guy was the payload commander, and I was very fortunate to be able to delegate a tremendous number of tasks to Guy. I depended on him to show the five rookies how to quickly adapt to and efficiently operate in the strange new environment of zero gravity and do what was required to achieve complete mission success. Any spacecraft commander looks for someone on the crew that he can count on to keep track of the big picture while working all the countless details and also make sure that nothing falls through the crack. And Guy did that perfectly for me. He's been described as unflappable, which is something you'd like to see in your astronauts. He's also the type of capable and reliable crewman that makes space missions successful, enjoyable, and memorable. And Guy's got the personality that makes it a joy to train with for many, many months before we go fly and, of course, to fly with. So I'm very proud to have been in the same astronaut class with Guy. I'm proud to have had the opportunity to fly with Guy on a challenging and completely successful space shuttle mission. And I'm immensely proud to induct Guy Bluford into the Astronaut Hall of Fame. Okay.
Wow, I'm uh, really impressed and uh, I feel very humbled to be here and uh, very privileged to have Mike Coates uh, represent me. You know, one of the things about flying in space is that uh, when you come down from flying in space, as a team you go around and thank the people who help make your mission a success. And uh, we take a great deal of pride in that. And what I was going to do this afternoon is to sort of do a little of that uh, with reference to my career. I'm a kid from uh, inner city Philadelphia, just to give you a feel. Grew up in the inner city of Philadelphia, and I, was, I grew up in the 1940s and 50s. I had great role models growing up in, in Philadelphia. I had a mother who was a uh, school teacher and a father who was a mechanical engineer. Uh, I went to great public schools, and in the 40s, really, my heroes were the Tuskegee Airmen, just to give you a feel. I grew up at a time when uh, aviation was making a lot of changes. I went from um, propeller-driven airplanes, and I remember a propeller-driven airplane, going from there to jets to rocket-powered airplanes. And I remember as a kid, astronauts were Flash Gordon and Ming and uh, Buck Rogers, you know, people that you saw in the, in the comic books. I liked making airplanes and uh, decided as a kid that I wanted to be an aerospace engineer. My heroes growing up were people like uh, Dick Whitcomb, who was a NASA engineer, uh, Jack uh, Northrop of Northrop uh, Aviation, and uh, um, Kelly Johnson of the Skunk Works. So I was uh, an officiallo, so to speak, of, of airplanes. And so I decided as a kid that I wanted to be an aerospace engineer. So I chased the dream. I've decided to chase the dream. And in 1960, I went to Penn State uh, to get a degree in aerospace engineering. While I was there, I discovered I had to take ROTC, which was, uh, I didn't notice that in the catalog. <laughs> so I had to take ROTC. So of course, I took Air Force. And then I decided I'd go advanced Air Force. And at that point, I was going to go in as an engineer until uh, I discovered between my junior and senior year that I could fly airplanes. And I thought, that sounds cool, and I'll uh, try and do that. And so in my senior year in ROTC, uh, the, the training was uh, getting a private pilot's license. And I remember uh, buzzing the uh, campus of Penn State University with uh, 172. When I graduated from Penn State in 64, I had a degree in aerospace engineering. I had a commission in the Air Force, and a uh, private pilot's license, so I was off and running. I went to pilot training, and I was fortunate enough to meet a guy by the name of Chappie James. I decided to be a gunfighter, and uh, I was fortunate enough to do that by flying F-4s in Vietnam. And then after Vietnam, I was a T-38 instructor pilot teaching future fighter pilots, not only for the Air Force, but for the uh, German Air Force as well. But I always wanted to be an engineer. And eventually I went back to school, got a master's degree and PhD in aerospace engineering, and became an aerospace engineer. And I led a branch at Wright Patterson doing leading edge research in aerospace engineering. So it was really a fabulous job. Once again, I decided to chase the dream, chase the dream. And in 77, I saw this uh, ad for uh, flying in space on the shuttle. I wasn't sure that that was for me. There were 70,000 people who applied for the program. I applied for the program, and in early uh, 78, I got this call from this strange guy. His name was George Abbey, okay? And it was uh, in the middle of January, and the snow was up to here, okay? And uh, he asked me what the weather was like in uh, Dayton, and I moaned and groaned for about five minutes and how I hated the snow and sleet and slush, for which George, in his monotone voice, said, hey, it doesn't snow in Houston. Would you like to come to Houston? <laughs> and at that point, I realized that I was a member of uh, uh, the eighth class of astronauts. I take a great deal of pride in part, being part of the TFNG, the 35 new guys. Uh, we came on board in 1978. It was a great experience. 
we were still learning how to fly the shuttle. So the shuttle was still being developed at that time. We really had uh, legendary people at the Johnson Space Center, everybody from Chris Kraft to uh, Lynn Lon Glenn Lunney, uh, Gene Kranz, a lot of those people. We also had legendary people in the astronaut office. We had uh, four people who went to the moon, John Young, Alan Bean, T.K. Mattingly, and Fred Hayes. Skylab people, as well as uh, Vance Brand, who, who flew on Apollo Soyuz. So it was a great time to come into the astronaut program. In 81, I was at Edwards when uh, Cripp and John brought uh, Columbia in for the first time, and I realized when they landed, we had a vehicle. We really had something that's really going to fly. I felt very fortunate. I flew on four teams in the astronaut office. Uh, and member of one, there's a member of each of those teams up here on the stage, okay? I flew with uh, Dan Brandenstein and Dick Trulli on STS-8, first night launch and first night landing of the shuttle. We worked real hard to maintain our night vision as we climbed into the cockpit that evening. I remember that, it was two o'clock in the morning. And when the solid rocket boosters went off, we forget about night vision, okay? It was really quite a ride. I realized on orbit how exciting that mission was, and I have to tell you, I was hooked on flying in space. That was a great, great experience. I was turned back around and flew on SCS-61 Alpha. I flew with a guy by the name of Hank Hartsfield, and uh, we uh, had a team of uh, three European astronauts. I joined up with Bonnie Dunbar. We ran a space lab in space, and it was an exciting experience working with Germans in space, and one of the nice features about Hank Hartsfield was that he was fluent in German, and that was really a very help when we had to deal with a lot of the German guys. I flew on my third flight with Mike Coates, fabulous guy to work with. Uh, we flew a very complicated, very challenging flight on STS-39. The thing I remember about Mike was Mike and I were the experienced guys. We were flying for the third time and we had five rookies. And you could tell that uh, these rookies were all excited about flying in space. Every simulator, every sim was exciting to them. And for me and Mike, it was another ascent sim, you know, another on orbit sim. Okay, we got to taste the space food again, you know. But we had these five guys who were all excited. And I had to remind them that this was a business trip, guys. <laughs> This is just a business trip. We're only going to be out of town for eight days. This is a business trip. Think about it as a business. Finally, I had an opportunity to fly on STS-53. I flew with Bob Cabana. It was the uh, dog team. We decided we'd be dog team. And so we all, gave, we all had dog names. The commander was Dave Walker. We had a dog mobile. We gave our trainers dog names, and we really had a good time. It was a classified DOD flight. I'd be happy to tell you what we did, but I'd have to uh, shoot all of you. <laughs> Bob Cabana was named Mighty Dog, you know, Marine type. My dog name was Doggone. So, <laughs> in 93, I decided to once again chase the dream. And uh, I left NASA. I joined a small uh, minority-owned company and had an opportunity to run the largest 8A contract ever awarded by the federal government, a $180 million company uh, contract. We did an awful lot of research in air-breathing engines and composite uh, materials and combustion in space and uh, space power, space communication, and we built experiments that flew on the shuttle. We did that for four years. Uh, the company was bought by another company called uh, Federal Data. I ran their uh, business uh, for three years, chasing contracts. We won a major contract with the International Space Station, and then I finished up with Northrop Grumman, and I was a vice president there, and I worked on putting in a um, payload ops center and building two uh, racks for the International Space Station, uh, combustion integration rack and the fluid integration rack, two racks, 
experiment racks that are currently on Destiny. I've been very fortunate to be a kid who grew up in inner city Philadelphia who wanted to be an aerospace engineer. But most importantly, I was very fortunate to, in my freshman year, met a woman who has been with me for 50 years. Uh, when I go out and talk to kids all the time, I tell them to work hard, aim high, and to chase their dreams. And that's what I, wanted, that's what I did. I want to congratulate the Astronaut Scholarship Foundation for their scholarships and for helping other people chase their dreams. Thank you very much. U.S. Astronaut Hall of Fame. Uh, before I go on, I actually just want to let you know, uh, obviously I'm using the teleprompter, which is I'm so grateful for, because um, I can't remember. STS-28B, I don't know those things. Um, uh, but uh, uh, there's a guy back there named Jeff who's running the teleprompter, and he's awesome, uh, except that I talk really fast. Um, so the poor guy, I'm seeing this the teleprompter going, <laughs> Uh, so please forgive me if occasionally I lose my place. Um, also, if you guys could do me a favor, um, I can't see these fantastically well-produced videos that are on. So when they're over, I don't know they're over. So <laughs> if you guys could applaud <laughs> vigorously, just go, woo, yeah, um, that would help me tremendously. Otherwise, I'll just sit up here and wait. Uh, but uh, I'd like to uh, move on now to our second inductee. Uh, indi see? See, this is what Jeff has to deal with. He's, uh, God bless him. Um, our second inductee today is Kathy Thornton. Thornton flew four space shuttle missions during her 12 years in the astronaut corps. During her second flight, she served as mission specialist throughout the first and only three-person spacewalk in May 1992. Thornton's first flight was as a mission specialist aboard the Department of Defense STS-33 mission and again aboard the maiden flight of Space Shuttle Endeavor. She served as mission specialist aboard the first Hubble Space Telescope repair mission, STS-61, along alongside fellow inductee Ken Bowersox, and later served as the payload commander on the second United States Microgravity Laboratory mission. Thornton has co-authored an elementary science textbook series in partnership with NASA, and currently she serves as the Associate Dean for Graduate Programs at the University of Virginia School of Engineering and Applied Science. Let's take a look at some video highlights from her career. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, astronaut Kathy Thornton.
To present Kathy Thornton for induction into the U.S. Astronaut Hall of Fame, please welcome Hall of Fame astronaut Dan Brandenstein. Thank you, John. Well, it's uh, certainly uh, my uh, privilege and honor to introduce uh, Kathy today. Uh, you've, you've heard all the technical stuff uh, from John's introduction and, and from the video, so uh, I'll uh, talk about some of the other things. Uh, the, uh, when you do something like this, you have to look for reliable sources, and uh, I couldn't find any from her childhood. So, <laughs> so we'll have to pick, her, pick it up after that. Uh, We'll kind of start around, uh, around graduating and, and going to college. Uh, she majored in physics, uh, at, uh, went to, got her undergraduate at Auburn, and then went, all right. Uh, went on uh, to the University of Virginia for her, uh, for her master's and PhD. Uh, uh, later, when she was on one of her uh, assignments uh, after graduating, somebody asked her, well, why'd, why do you study physics? Uh, her answer was, well, home ec was full. In chemistry, you had to pay for the beakers if you broke them in the lab, and math was too theoretical. So, uh, but anyhow, she graduated, I think did some research after that, but ended up uh, with a job uh, with the U.S. Army as an intelligence analyst. Uh, it uh, was back in the 1983, while she was working with these Army guys uh, analyzing intelligence, uh, that uh, the uh, call came for another astronaut selection, and, and a lot of these Army officers were, were getting it through the military chain of command and were you know, looking to apply for, uh, for the astronaut program. And you know, so Kathy kind of asked about that, and they said, well, <laughs> you're not in the military, you know. Uh, so uh, she found a different route, uh, probably through NASA, I'm sure it was through NASA, and uh, did in fact put in an application. Uh, she was successful at that, uh, had the opportunity to go to Houston and get interviewed. Uh, was successful at that, and somewhere down the road, uh, she got, just like Guy, she got a call from this Abby guy, and uh, wanted to know if uh, she wanted to come and be an astronaut. Uh, she said, uh, well, uh, she'd think about it, but, but Steve, Steve was over in, in Europe uh, doing some research, and, and you know, she wanted to check with him. Uh, by the way, at, to this point, she hadn't even told him about it yet. <laughs> so. Uh, so she, but she had a lot of resources, so she, Abby gave her an hour to say whether or not she wanted to you know, come to Houston and be an astronaut. Uh, she had a lot of resources with that Army job, so the Army headquarters in Germany had the uh, MPs out looking for Steve, so she could say, hey, I, I got this kind of neat job, is it all right, uh, you, we go do this. And uh, uh, anyhow, they didn't get to him in time, so she accepted anyhow. Uh, she, uh, she arrived in Houston uh, without Steve, uh, because he was still a professor at the University of Virginia and uh, continued to, to be that uh, throughout her career. But uh, she did have uh, Carol, one of her daughters, with her at that point in time and, and came into the astronaut office in the class of 84, which uh, is, is kind of a famous class. Uh, they, uh, their nickname were the Maggots, and uh, it's a long stories, and there are a lot of stories associated with that, so uh, you can corner her later and, and find out about, about all that. Uh, after she finished the astronaut candidate uh, training, uh, they decided to increase their family, and, and uh, Laura was born. And then uh, later she got assigned to SDS-33 and, and flew that, uh, and we'll talk a little bit about that later. But uh, after that, they decided to increase the family a little bit more, and Susan was born. And all this time, uh, still uh, retaining uh, and doing the responsibilities uh, of her job in the astronaut office. Uh, uh, KT is, is, you know, a, a, was a really smart person, kind of quiet and unassuming but could be very assertive uh, if uh, was required. There's a chuckle from her family over there. Uh, she's, uh, she's, not, uh, she's not real big on protocol. Uh, she's just interested in getting the job done. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about some of the flight experiences. Uh, mentioned previously, STS-33 was a classified mission, so obviously there are not many stories about that. Uh, one I did glean from them because it wasn't classified. Apparently during re-entry, uh, the, the commander and the pilot uh, we're having some discussion back and forth uh, on some subject, and, and KT on that uh, for entry was on the mid deck, so she couldn't see what was going on. All she heard was coming across the intercom, and uh, her response was, just make up your mind and do it. Uh, once again, that's her uh, get it done philosophy. Then uh, when I uh, had the opportunity to fly with, uh, with KT was on SDS-49. Uh, that's where we were supposed to go up and do one spacewalk and then rescue Intelsat satellite and then do th three spacewalks uh, to demonstrate uh, space station assembly tasks. Well, uh, as you all know, it, it didn't quite go that way. 
But anyhow, by that time, uh, uh, there were three daughters uh, that uh, KT was, uh, was herding around uh, her home. Uh, they're very energetic uh, and adventuresome. And, and one of the favorite things for the SDS-49 crew were every morning in the training session to come in and, and hear the stories uh, of what the younger uh, Thorntons were doing uh, in uh, their adventures uh, throughout their neighborhood, uh, such as walking along fences, uh, raising uh, various chaos in the neighborhood, and going so far as writing their own excuse notes to their teacher to miss uh, classes. Uh, I think some of this get it done philosophy of hers got passed on to her kids. Uh, also, we noticed that, uh, based on those stories about her, her youngsters, uh, that uh, the apples probably didn't fall very fi far from the tree uh, because there were a lot of similar stories uh, about KT from the, the, her college days uh, and her NASA days. Uh, don't have time for a lot of those, but one of the most memorable ones for our training sessions, we were down here as a crew for STS-49 training uh, on escape and rescue. Uh, you know, the, you go up and man the vehicle, and, you, and if you have a big emergency, you jump in a basket, slide down a wire, you hop in a tank, and, and you drive this tank, and you know, KT really, really grooved on driving that tank, you know, this big armored personnel carrier. But, uh, but the, the, the fire rescue guys had a, a new vehicle. Uh, they were kind of testing it out. It was an amphibious vehicle, and uh, they let KT drive it. And she went through the swamp, through the, I mean, she was testing all the amphibious capabilities of this vehicle. Uh, she, you know, went too close to a limb, took off the windshield. And uh, I'm, I'm sure that, uh, well, you could see, if you look in the eye, the fire and rescue guys, you know, you know they were terrified. Uh, the rest of the crew riding along were terrified. Uh, and uh, I'm not sure, but I, I'd be willing to bet that the fire rescue crew never let another crew person drive that vehicle. Uh, during the mission, SDS-49, as I said, we had, uh, it took us three tries to get the satellite. Uh, we had three guys out doing the spacewalk, and uh, Kathy, uh, we referred to her as the, the director of EVA, because when somebody's out doing a spacewalk, you have somebody inside that's really riding herd on them, make sure they're doing everything in the right sequence, and, and once again, uh, that assertiveness and get it done uh, came through because uh, she was on top of them the whole time. Uh, fortunately, on the, the fourth spacewalk, uh, KT got the, her chance, uh, and that was uh, some of the assembly tasks. Uh, many of them were long and difficult tasks, uh, really uh, uh, hard work. And uh, we had, you know, they had a heart rate monitor, so uh, I could verify that, uh, that she was going beat for beat uh, with Tom Akers, who was the other person uh, doing an EVA, and really did an outstanding job. And you know, when you were out uh, on the, as we call it, a rubber chicken circuit, you talk a lot, of, quite often I got to ask, well, can women do that space stuff? And I always should point to KT, and, and based on the, that performance uh, on uh, that spacewalk, I say, you bet they can, and then some. Uh, following that, uh, her next mission was STS-61, uh, the Hubble Repair. She had an opportunity to do two spacewalks on that. Uh, she uh, repaired and replaced the solar arrays and also installed the CoStar, which is, uh, corrected the optics uh, of the Hubble. Remember, Hubble went up with a, a problem, and they had to correct the optics. Uh, one of her tasks was to take, when she took the solar array off, to take the solar array and just chuck it and uh, ask her about, well, you know, what did it feel like uh, tossing a multi-million dollar solar array away? She, no problem, it was broke. <laughs> so along with, uh, along with the, uh, the two EVAs that KT and Tom Akers did, uh, there were three done by, by Jeff Hoffman and Story, uh, members of our Hall of Fame, and uh, obviously the result of that mission was a tremendous success. Uh, her last uh, mission, uh, she was, uh, was a space lab mission, it was a six-day mission, two shift operations, uh, essentially working around the clock, uh, and she was the payload uh, commander on that. Uh, she was responsible for pulling all the experiments together and getting everything lined up so it went smoothly on orbit. Uh, there were a vast array of microgravity experiments uh, on that mission, and uh, she planned it and, and got the rest of the crew lined up and, and did an exceedingly good job. Uh, that dedication and hard work carried through to uh, up on orbit, and the result was a very successful mission. Uh, in 1996, uh, KT left the astronaut office and returned to academia, but she continues to serve the space program uh, when called on various uh, review boards and councils. Uh, her family is with her today, uh, her husband Steve, and uh, <laughs> daughter Carol, where's Carol? And, and sitting next to Carol is Mike, uh, her, her fiance, uh, uh, there's a wedding next Sunday. By those, uh, those two are getting married. It was really neat. Uh, and then Laura, and uh, and then uh, here we go, Susan. Susan. So it's uh, 
I'm not sure who wrote the notes to the teacher, but, uh, but it was one of those three. <laughs> okay, well, to wrap it up, uh, you know, the acid up job is, is a very high intensity, stressful job uh, with uh, all the training, uh, research and development, mission support, and public appearances uh, that are required. Uh, and, and you can ask any of the guys how tough the job is. But, uh, but to do all this while raising three daughters and maintaining a household is truly phenomenal. Ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to introduce the newest member of the Astronaut Hall of Fame, Dr. Kathy Thornton. that there are some, mem some members of the audience who have some stories from my childhood here, but I'm glad you didn't uh, run into them in time to <laughs> get any information. You know, unlike Guy, I've not really had a life's plan. My, my career has sort of been a random walk, and uh, I, I owe you know, a lot of what I have and have done to opportunities that came along and people who made those opportunities possible. You know, first of all, my family, who's been with me through this entire incredible journey, Today we had an unforgettable tour of, the, uh, of, it, of Endeavor in the OPF, and uh, thank you for that, Bob. My family got to see, um, for the first time, real flight hardware, even though th this has been very much a part of their entire lives for, for many years, and I hope got to understand why it took me away from them for so much time. Uh, my husband Steve and I have been married 31 years last month. Uh, we got married in a very small, private, civil ceremony by the sheriff in Charlottesville, Virginia, wearing a gun, by the way. <laughs> and, um, but you know, when, when we walked through the red, down the red carpet last night at the gala, I think that's the first time he has ever walked down an aisle with me. <laughs> I say it's about time. <laughs> so they, you know, all my thanks to them for staying with me through all this. Uh, thanks especially to Dan, who as Chief of the Astronaut Office and as Commander on STS-49 gave me an opportunity to do a spacewalk that um, would have been an easier decision to give to someone who is less vertically challenged than I, but uh, he took a chance on me and I'll forever be grateful for that. I'm also thankful to all the guys that I flew with, and I say guys because with the exception of one, they were all guys. Let's see, uh, John and Jeff and Story and Covey and Dan and socks. Hey, we all flew together. They uh, kindly vacated the mid-deck where I could bathe and dress. Uh, they also took over the mid-deck and banished me to the flight deck while they dressed and then forgot about me while they had their breakfast and left me up there alone <laughs> for long periods of time. But they were, they were wonderful guys to work with and I couldn't have asked for, for better uh, friends and colleagues through all those missions. And I want to finally thank the Astronaut Hall of Fame members here for letting me be a member of your amazing club. And I hope that I can live up to, to the expectations. So thank you all so much. Congratulations, Kathy Thornton, and welcome to the U.S. Astronaut Hall of Fame. Uh, our next inductee today is Frank Culbertson, Jr. Uh, Culbertson joined the Astronaut Corps in 1984. In November 1990, he piloted STS-38, the first shuttle to land at Kennedy Space Center since 1985. He then commanded STS-51, which concluded with the first night landing at KSC. Culbertson commanded the International Space Station for 117 days during his final mission on STS-105. Culbertson served in many NASA leadership roles, including, including Deputy Chief of Flight Crew Operations, ISS Support Chief, uh, Chief of Astronaut Office Mission Support Branch, Chief of the JSC Russian Projects Manager, oh, oh wait, Manager of the Shuttle Mir Program, <laughs> and finally, as ISS Deputy Program Manager. Currently, he is Senior Vice President and Deputy General Manager of the Advanced Programs Group at Orbital Sciences Corporation and oversees all human space flight for the company. Let's take a look at some video highlights from his career.
Name your touchdown. Ladies and gentlemen, astronaut Frank Culbertson, Jr. Here to present Frank Culbertson Jr. for induction into the U.S. Astronaut Hall of Fame, please welcome back to the stage Hall of Fame astronaut and NASA Administrator Charles Bolden. John, thank you very much. And uh, you know, it's I, I am going to try not to talk about Frank's professional uh, acumen and all of his records and everything because you've already heard many of them. Um, I really want to talk a little bit about the man, but let me say one thing about this class because I think it's incredible. Uh, one of the things that is striking to me is that in addition to their professional prowess, they are probably four of the most spectacular, just downright good human beings that I had an opportunity to, to get to know in my time in the astronaut office. So congratulations to the four of you. Um, you know, what I, don't, I don't know how rare it is to have two Hall of Famers soon. Uh, who are connected through two generations, but uh, such is the case with Frank Culbertson and me. Unbeknownst to either of us, while we were high school students, our mothers worked together as members of the South Carolina Human Relations Council during the 1960s in an effort to head off the kind of violent activities of the Civil Rights era that were sweeping through the segregated South. As a first year midshipman at the Naval Academy, I visited Frank's school, Holly Hill High, to talk about life at the Naval Academy. Three, aha! Three years later, Frank arrived at the Naval Academy as a member of the class of 1971. Since then, we've been following each other around in our professional careers. The stories of Frank's rise from student to astronaut and now industrial leader and innovator are full of humor in spite of Frank's always serious demeanor. <laughs> Cousin Janet, and I think Janet's here. I know Janet is, I, she, I think. But Cousin Janet told of how the family always, quote, marveled but were never surprised by his singular path from Holly Hill to Annapolis to Japan and to space. Her pride when they drive through the Frank Culbertson interchange on I-95 and I-26 <laughs> en route from, Char from Charleston, South Carolina to Charlotte, North Carolina always makes them proud. Or the time that Frank broke his arm when he struck Janet's brother on the head and ended up getting the worst of it. Naval Academy classmate Frank Fuchs reminisced about a liberty foray from the academy into D.C. I know you told me not to relay any of this stuff, but that's all right. <laughs> but they were in Frank's, or as they called him, Colby's car. It was a British hatch hatchback. And uh, when they got to the bar, well, when they got to the eating establishment, yes. allegedly there was no parking space. So they decided to physically lift the car up into a spot in front of the D.C. watering hole only to find that the car had become quite a bit heavier after the evening of drinking. <laughs> Frank's time with SIAC brought its share of Frank Culbertson lore also. As Walt Haverstein relayed about Frank's United Way team being quote unquote rewarded for their superb fundraising performance with a solo trumpet performance by Frank. Frank had been on the D&B, the Drum and Bugle Corps at the Naval Academy as a coronet player. I guess they were, what they call them trumpet? Bugles. Bugles. All right. All realized that it was a good thing that Frank had, gone to, had become an aviator uh, because he never would have made it as a professional musician. Carl Walls, Franks, Frank wants me to ask you one thing. And he says he wants to know if you recall the Flight Day 2 Axtos pre-deployed discovery of the mangled ASE and the obvious scorch marks on the MLI at the back of the payload bay. So he wanted to remind you of one exploit from there. No matter what stories you hear, however, uh, in my estimation, there is no question of the quality of the man, Frank Culbertson, being inducted into the Astronaut Hall of Fame today. 
whether as, as a leader in his church, our church, while we were in Houston together, and KT's, as a matter of fact, uh, as a father to his children, a sibling to his sisters, or a friend to many whose lives he has touched, he is truly in a league of his own. Jackie and I are the proud godparents to Frank's and Rebecca's son and daughter, Frank and Annie. And we've watched the girls, Wendy, Amanda, and Ashley, grow up to become beautiful, productive young women. Frank's friendship is endless and loyal, and his passion about the future of human spaceflight and his dedication to helping us realize the promise of that bright future speak volumes to his qualification to be with us here today. It's my distinct honor as a fellow South Carolinian to, represent, to present to you my dear, lifelong friend, Frank Culbertson. Thank you all very much, and uh, this is an amazing honor. And uh, um, I'd first like to thank General Charles Bolden, my buddy Charlie, um, for those kind words and for his leadership my entire life almost. And um, I tell you, I have to tell you, Charlie, I think, has the hardest job in the country right now, certainly in the space program. And uh, he is executing that job with, with courage, humility, and calmness in a way that we all can follow and trust and I think will bring us to the future in a way that we'll all be very proud. And Charlie, thank you very much for being in the position you're in. And yes, I have followed Charlie into many, many uh, jobs and careers over the years and I am not eager to follow you into that one, believe me. <laughs> But I'm happy to help all I can. Um, there's a lot of people I need to thank today, and, and I will do my best to do that. Um, I'm still pretty surprised to have ever been selected as an astronaut. So to be here as a part of the Hall of Fame to me is just an amazing, amazing uh, miracle. Um, I've always tried to do my best and tried to be a great teammate or be a good teammate with great teams and tried to, to contribute all I can to make sure that, that uh, everyone is successful as best we can be. And, um, and I've been fortunate to be a part of a lot of really good teams, starting way back when. And uh, uh, <clears throat> I knew if Charlie cried a little bit, I'd probably cry a little bit too, so this is going to be hard. We're a lot alike. But uh, that first team is sitting down there in, in the, around the third and fourth rows, and that's my sister's. And I want to thank them for <clears throat> putting up with me and, and for being great sisters. And uh, we came from really awesome parents who I really wish could be here today. They would be very proud of all of us. And, uh, and they were great supporters of the space program and, and I know are smiling down on us today. Um, going through the Naval Academy, I was a part of a terrific company. One of my former roommate is here, Frank Fuchs, and uh, at least four of my classmates are here. Uh, two of them up on the stage here. I think we're the second academy class to reach uh, uh, a membership of three in the Hall of Fame, and, and uh, I think uh, um, I'm, I'm very proud of that, and I really appreciate uh, being a part of that. Um, being a member of the Navy team throughout my career was, was uh, something I was also very proud of, and, and unlike Kathy, I did have a plan, and uh, I had planned since I was 11 to be a Navy pilot, and since I was 12 to be a test pilot, and since I was 13 to be an astronaut. Now, there was a long wait between the time I actually got selected and a lot of p potential sidetracks and side trips. Uh, but I always wanted to do that, and I wanted to be like these guys on the front row here. And uh, they were my heroes, and I read all about them and learned everything I could. A lot of them had gone to the Naval Academy. Sorry, Buzz. But, uh, <laughs> but I did want to be a Navy pilot, and, uh, and, and I knew that that was a path for me that would, would get me to at least close to my dream, and if not, I'd be able to do things that I felt would be productive and, and uh, hopefully valuable to the country. Um, as I went through the, my Navy career, I had a chance to serve with a lot of people. I applied to the test pilot school four times, and finally on the fourth try, after I think 
getting tired of me applying. They finally said, all right, you can come in. And uh, I managed to get into the class of 81. Prior to that, I had applied to the astronaut program in, in the same group that Charlie and, and uh, Pinky and others had, had applied to and was told, don't bother, you're not a test pilot. And, uh, and so I kept trying to get in and, and was determined that I was going to somehow at least give myself the best shot at doing that. And fortunately, in 1984, I was uh, uh, selected for an interview in the very last group in, uh, in that year. And uh, very late in the process, I got a phone call from that same Mr. Abbey. And uh, he said, uh, I just come back from an uh, air combat training flight in the Navy F-14. And he said, how's it going, Frank? No, first of all, I'm sorry, it was a guy named Dwayne Ross on the phone. And Dwayne said, hey, Frank, how's it going? And I was expecting either John or George if I was going to get selected, or Dwayne if I wasn't. And I said, well, I don't know, Dwayne. I guess not so good. And he said, well, can you hold for a second for Mr. Abbey? And I said, well, sure. <laughs> And, uh, and, and, uh, and George asked me a couple of questions, and they said, well, you know, we'd, we'd really like you to think about coming down here to work for us. I was not as quick as Kathy, and I said, oh, yeah, I'll be right there. <laughs> Should have said, well, I'll think about it a little bit, but he'd have known I was lying. Um, and, and, uh, and being a member of the Maggots is a fantastic team that I'm always proud of, and, and Shep, thanks for uh, awarding us with that name. And, uh, and Kathy, thanks for putting up with it until you finally got used to it. Um, fantastic people to, to work with throughout. And, um, uh, you know, the thing about the, the intersection in South Carolina that uh, Charlie mentioned, what he didn't mention is he's got about 11 miles of freeway that uh, are in the upper part of the state. Uh, but, uh, but I am proud to be a part of, uh, um, from that state and, and, uh, and a friend of Charlie's. And, and uh, there are a number of us from South Carolina in the program, including Charlie Duke who, uh, who uh, set an example for us, and Ron McNair, who also set a fantastic example for us on the Challenger. So uh, it's, it's very humbling for me to be, be a part of that. The, um, the team that I do really have to thank the most, though, is, is Rebecca and the kids. Because <laughs> all of them did put up with a lot. And uh, Rebecca and I have been, been married for almost uh, 23 years. She's sitting there counting, thinking, is he right? <laughs> and, 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 and she is, has done a fantastic job of, of raising all the kids that we have and, and all the grandkids and, uh, and, and has set an example that, that we all love following and has always stood beside me even when I was gone almost all the time or having to, to uh, sit by myself and learn Russian or uh, waiting for airplanes or waiting for me to not launch, which happened on STS-51 five times. Um, she had the hardest job getting the kids to get back on that prop plane and eat those goldfish again to get back to Houston so we could go back into quarantine again. But, uh, but she did a great job of keeping the team together and helping organize and, and, uh, and motivating everybody and keeping them calm while I noticed that she wasn't always feeling so calm. Uh, the toughest time for Rebecca, I think, was on September the 11th, 2001. Uh, I happened to be the commander of the space station at that time. And uh, she had to endure all of that without me here and, uh, and help tracked down all the kids and make sure everybody was all right, and then made the phone call to me with the help of NASA to let me know she had found everybody and everybody was okay and, uh, and, and knew what to do. And, uh, and then she had to endure three more months of being, me being gone while the country was changing and the world was changing. My children, I am so proud of. They all turned out pretty darn good despite me. And, and I am just cannot tell you uh, how great it is to have all of you here and all those children you're producing. We have five grandchildren. The uh, youngest is 11 days old and, uh, and made the trip here. And, uh, uh, and only two of them are having kids so far, so I think we've got more coming. And, uh, and, and I'm looking forward to that. Uh, I really want to thank the foundation. I want to thank the committee that selected us. Um, it was probably like when they selected me for the astronaut office. There was another guy with a long name they meant to get, but, you know, I came up first, so I managed to get in. But uh, this is a tremendous honor for me. I will do everything I can to help the foundation in the future. And uh, it's a real privilege to be a member of, of this club. I've always felt privileged to serve the country and to, to be a member of both the military and the astronaut corps. But most of all, to be a member of the NASA team and the space community because we have got one heck of a job ahead of us and keeping the leadership of the United States in space, maintaining our technological leadership by ensuring that we are educating our children in science, technology, engineering, and math, and by setting the kind of examples of leadership that the people up here set 
so that our children know what to do when they are in leadership positions. It's all about that. It's all about uh, building a future for them, and it's all about having the courage to make the hard decisions to make that happen and, uh, and being willing to, to spend our resources on it. And I think there's nothing more important than moving the frontiers further and further out, and uh, this is the community that does it. This is the one that, that takes the risks, whether you fly in space or you make the decisions to fly into space or you put the, the wrench to the bolt and tighten it to just the right amount. It takes a lot of courage to do that right and then allow somebody or help somebody get into that seat and ride that rocket. Someday we're going to go a long, long way out into space and it's going to get harder and harder as we do that. And it's going to take this next generation following this generation and the ones out here uh, who are setting a great example to, to keep that going. And we need to do that. We absolutely need to do that. So again, Charlie, thank you for your leadership. Al and your team, thank you very much for what you're doing. And to the entire uh, Astronaut Hall of Fame and uh, Astronaut Scholarship Foundation, thank you so much for this amazing privilege. Thank you. Congratulations, Frank Culberson, Jr and welcome to the U.S. Astronaut Hall of Fame. Our final inductee today is Ken Bowersox. Uh, Bowersox piloted the precedent-setting mission to the crippled Hubble Space Telescope in 1993, capturing and restoring it to full capability through a record five spacewalks. He also served as pilot aboard the first flight of the United States Microgravity Laboratory and the first extended duration orbiter flight. Bowersox flew three more shuttle missions, commanding the laboratory's second flight for STS-73 and the second Hubble Space Telescope maintenance mission for STS-82. Launching on STS-113, he lived aboard the International Space Station from November 2002 through May 2003 as commander of Expedition 6, the first crew of U.S. astronauts to return to Earth in the Russian Soyuz spacecraft. Currently, he is SpaceX Vice President of Astronaut Safety and Mission Assurance. Way to go, Ken. <laughs> Take a look at some video highlights from his career. It was an exciting career while it... Uh... <laughs> um, we will reenact all of his launches right now on stage. Come on, Ken. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, astronaut Ken Bowersox. To present Ken Bowersox for induction into the U.S. Astronaut Hall of Fame is Hall of Fame astronaut Dick Covey. Well, the only thing between 500 people and a cold iced tea is me and socks. <laughs> Well, we almost got to see all the great accomplishments of Ken Bowersox on the video, but it, it, it was four o'clock and I think we were supposed to be done at four and somebody pulled the plug. So we're gonna get through this. I'm gonna try to put his accomplishments in perspective though, because uh, if you peel the onion just a little bit, you find out that Sox is a man of many firsts and seconds. First, Sox is uh, a member of the 19, the first member of the 1987 class of astronauts. Now this class picked up the nickname of the, the Gaffers. And for my astronaut friends who don't remember, the Gaff and Gaffer standard stood for George Abbey's final 15. A lasting legacy it is. 
Socks has another first. In fact, it's not just a first, it's an only. Um, you know, most of the pilot astronauts uh, wanted to fly the space shuttle and command a mission and be responsible for uh, the crew on orbit and land a thing and, and do all those piloting stuff. But there was a couple that actually then went on to become space station commanders. Frank Culbertson was one, Sox was the other. But Sox, well, Sox did something that no other space shuttle commander was able to do and that was to finagle a spacewalk on either a space shuttle or a space station mission. So I guess after watching 10 spacewalks during his two Hubble missions, he decided this is pretty easy, I know how to do it, and must have thought that spending five and a half months on the International Space Station with Don Pettit was worth a couple of spacewalks. <laughs> Sox had the misfortune of being on the International Space Station when we lost Columbia and her crew. The subsequent grounding of the space shuttle fleet took away his ride home until the Russians offered up a seat on a Soyuz. So then Sox became one of the first two U.S. astronauts to return to Earth on a Soyuz spacecraft. The only problem was that Sox didn't land where he was supposed to and they got lost in Kazakhstan. But in the process of doing that, Sox introduced us to the now infamous Soyuz ballistic entry, another first. Have you noticed that things come in duplicates for Sox? And uh, you might not have seen this, but I'll peel in the onion a little bit. Either he's really good at what he does, or the flight crew operations folks making assignments wanted to make it easy on him. So his, uh, I'll give you an example, his first commander was Dick Richards. Uh, when assigned for a pretty quick turn to another mission, they gave him another commander named Dick. Now, I think he could have learned another commander's name. <laughs> but then, it would have forever precluded him from being able to say that he started his astronaut career flying with a bunch of dicks. <laughs> Right, Sox. Perfect. Perfect. <laughs> now you look at the missions that he flew. The first one was the United States Microgravity Laboratory 1. And he was the pilot on that mission. His third mission was the United States Micro Lab Microgravity Laboratory 2. And he was the commander. His second mission, he was pilot on the first Hubble servicing mission. His fourth mission, he was commander on the second Hubble servicing mission. Come on, Sox, where's the challenge? <laughs> now, there was something that Sox did for me that I'll be for, forever grateful for. Uh, for many years, uh, Frank Culbertson and I and the crew of STS-38 held a record for the most screwed up T-38 crew arrival at the Kennedy Space Center. We landed with uh, three low-level lights on and um, a lot of, uh, well, let's see, a, a lot of uh, entertaining comments from our astronaut buddies. Well, when Sox and his crew came down for STS-82, they had four T-38s, and they managed to declare emergencies for all four of them because of low fuel. <laughs> Thanks, Sox. It's a monkey I wanted off my back. For a Navy guy, Sox has an affinity for the Air Force. Now, you know, if you look at his bio and everything you know, he graduated from the Naval Academy. Uh, he's got a master's degree from Columbia University. He's not dumb, but he couldn't get into Navy TPS. So the Navy sent him to the Air Force Test Pilot School. Now, this is what I think is really interesting. He works for a company now whose rockets are named after the Air Force Academy mascot, the Falcon. I am told there's no truth, absolutely no truth, to the story that Sox, as a condition of his SpaceX employment, tried to get Elon to change the name of the rocket to Bill the Goat, the <laughs> Naval Academy mascot. Sox's lasting contribution to show business, however, may be his greatest distinguishing accomplishment amongst the astronauts. Now, Hoot was almost smarter than a fifth grader,
Dan Barry got voted off the island in Survivor, and Buzz, well, Buzz, we admire you greatly for Dancing with the Stars. <laughs> but Sox is the astronaut king of sitcom. He made three guest appearances on a tool time segment of Home Improvement during the mid-1990s. Each time he went with his shuttle crew, each time a hit show. And I can almost repeat his lines from the first time because they were wonderful and done in a style that I think even John would have been proud of. Several years ago, some friends of mine were in Warsaw, Poland. And after returning uh, to their hotel room one day, they found a rerun of Home Improvement on Polish TV. <laughs> it was a Sox episode. When they got back to the States, they uh, were eager to call me and tell me that they thoroughly enjoyed watching my friend on the rerun and all of the astronaut shenanigans that he brought to the show, but they were most impressed to see that he could speak Polish. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, I present the newest member of the Astronaut Hall of Fame, a man of many firsts and seconds, my Polish-speaking friend, Sox. Thanks, Covey, for the introduction. I used to call him Covey when we were flying together because I didn't want to call him Dick and confuse him with the other guy. Um, but uh, it, it was really great having you uh, introduce me today. Uh, I learned a lot from, from Covey on STS-61. Uh, you all may remember that um, there was a lot of pressure on the whole NASA team prior to that mission. Uh, the Hubble Space Telescope wasn't working as well um, as we all hoped. Um, but it was still working pretty well, and there were a lot of people that were worried we were going to make it worse instead of better. Um, and so uh, we went through the training, we got on orbit, and um, as we're on orbit, uh, the EVA crew's outside, and Tom Akers is looking out the window, uh, talking to the, the folks while they're working, and uh, Claude Nicolier is over on the arm, and KT and I are doing our thing. Uh, Akers mentions that Covey sure isn't around very much. He was down on the, the mid-deck, doing other useful work that needed to be done by the team. And so when he floated back upstairs, we said, hey, Covey, this is a really important mission. Uh, you know, you're, 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 you seem to be awfully relaxed about it all. He goes, hey, man, I'm retiring after this mission. You guys have a lot more to lose than I do. <laughs> but, but what I, I learned from that was a great way to succeed as a leader uh, and our mission was very successful, uh, largely because of Covey's leadership, is to build your team, build a good plan, and then turn your team loose to accomplish the plan. Get out of their way and let them do their job and, uh, and, and trust them. And, and Covey did that, and, uh, and, and I'll always remember that. Um, this is a, a great day for me. Uh, I mean, yesterday was a great day because we got to launch a new rocket for the first time, my, my company did. Um, yeah. And today I get this really neat medal, <laughs> and I get to sit up here with uh, folks that taught me um, everything I know about space exploration, and, uh, and, and folks that I didn't get to work with in the astronaut office, but who uh, inspired me when I was a kid. Uh, and, uh, even if I'd never become an astronaut, which was something I always wanted to do, um, helped get me to study science and technology um, in school um, and, and learn things that were um, very important to, for accomplishing my dreams. Um, but the best part of it all um, is to see the work that these folks are still doing with the Astronaut Scholarship Foundation. Um, science, technology, education is really important for building the future leaders of our exploration programs. 
Uh, space exploration is a team sport, and you'll hear this a lot. Uh, very few people get to ride on the vehicles that go into space and spend time in space, uh, and there are thousands of people that are required to make it possible. And without good, strong science and uh, technology education in our country, space exploration will be something that other countries do. So it's great for me to see what the Astronaut Scholarship Foundation does to, to build our team and make exploration possible in our country. Um, in closing, I just want to say thanks to my family, uh, Annie and my boys, Matt, Tim, and Luke, for all the support they've given me over the years um, as I've uh, worked uh, on a lot of different missions uh, in a lot of different strange places. And I want to thank all of you for making this a, a great day for me and my family. Thanks. Congratulations, Ken Bowersox, and welcome to the U.S. Astronaut Hall of Fame. Ladies and gentlemen, I am proud to present to you the class of 2010 U.S. Astronaut Hall of Fame inductees, Guy Blooper Jr., Kathy Thornton, Frank Culbertson Jr., Jr. and Ken Bowersox. All the members of the U.S. Astronaut Hall of Fame. Gentlemen. Well, it has been my pleasure to be with you guys today, and on behalf of the Kennedy Space Center Visitor Complex and the Astronaut Scholarship Foundation, thank you for joining us for this historic ceremony. Please remain standing as the Hall of Fame astronauts make their grand exit down the red carpet.